Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Well, this took a while. Chen Yu Vale highlights some interesting aspects of Genshin's lore, but was shown quite quickly, I must say. From the instant teleportation to the end of the story, to realizing that lack of communication and T was the sole reason for this dilemma in the first place. Not saying that that's a problem, but you could easily miss the huge lore because of how quickly it was shown. One is Chen Yu Vale's irrigation and trade problem, which hides the history of the entire valley. The other are the views on humanity's autonomy against the heavenly principles, or as we can call them, natural order. Lastly, some details on the fourth mural, Chen Yu Vale's ancestors from the chasm, the falling star that created it, and the divine nail. This to me is huge since Fujin, the herb lord, and Ling Yuan are the few adepti in Li Wen that worked under a god that wasn't Zhong Li, who if you could remember, It was signed before it all began. I have always honored the contract, and kept my silence. And even better because they're still alive to tell the tales. So as we go through that, along with some other details I can squeeze into the video, hopefully I can give you a clear understanding of Chen Yu Vale's lore. Timestamps below for those who want to go straight into a specific segment. Let's go! Chen Yu Vale's Blessing of Sunken Jade is the main world quest of 4.4. The first and most important thing I need to mention is that Chen Yu Vale is told through the eyes of the three Adepti who swore to protect Chen Yu Vale's natural order. The Illuminated Beast Ling Yuan, the White Snake Adeptus called the Herb Lord, and the Golden Carp Adeptus Fujin. Depending on your perspective, there are at least two states of natural order. One maintains the order that Chen Yu Vale possesses today with a narrow, fast-flowing river, cultivation of tea trees, and more importantly, the nature that humanity dominates and regulates. This human-dominated order is apparent in all the regions that we've already been to, like Liyue's autonomy after Morax's departure, or Fontaine even though Nouvellet sort of manages the region, even in Inazuma and Sumeru, and especially Monstad. Although Archons, Dragons, Adepti, and other very powerful beings are protecting humans, humanity is more or less left to their own devices and solve their own problems, to a certain extent. In contrast, the other is a state of order that goes back at least 3,000 years ago before the Archon War, where the river was once deep and peaceful, the magical beasts and creatures were free to roam wherever they pleased, and humanity had little say to the rule of their god. In this time, Kiaoying village was only a barren, lifeless mountain, and on this mountain was its master the wild and free Ling Yuan, whose adeptal energy as the Suwani are innately possessed, similar to elemental beings, bishops like Ejdaha or dragons like Nuvolet. Suanis are capable of creating familiars to help protect themselves in battle, hence the Xuanwen beasts. And the best among them was Ling Yuan, characterized by her darker blue tone compared to other teal-colored Suwani. The barren mountain and its master Ling Yuan was separated from the humans of that era by a large flowing river. Later, she met and fought the two Adepti, Fujin and the Herb Lord, who after defeating and befriending Ling Yuan would plant tea trees on her mountain. You can find their first tea tree on the hill across Kiaoying village, with an interesting hidden mini puzzle that later reveals their promise to have tea with other Adepti. Reluctantly, Ling Yuan would allow it and also let humans live on the mountain who marveled at Ling Yuan's grace and beauty. This would spark confusion to Ling Yuan as a beast who didn't understand the rationality and emotions that Fujin and the Herb Lord felt with the humans. To the point that both Fujin and the Herb Lord would take the form of a human to join them in their endeavors. At some point, Ling Yuan also took a human form. And apparently she really liked food and needed thinning potions from the Herb Lord. While the Herb Lord herself possessed fair skin and red eyes in her human form. A red iris, I guess. So Baizu would only inherit the snake pupil and not the iris. I mean, what? All of this is revealed in the world quest and the books within Chen Yu Vale, in case you missed it. It's worth noting that Fujin and the Herb Lord were part of Chen Yu Vale and not Liwei Harbor at the time. Fujin seemed to never know what Liyue Harbor looked like, and it was planned that they would visit, but it never really happened. Now, while humanity was prospering with their crops near the deep, quiet river, the prosperity and, by extension, their survival was also tied to the god and illuminated beasts of Chen Yu Vale that shared a pact of blessings and dreams with the sky and its messengers, becoming priests and emissaries of the humans. Their means of communing with the sky and creating miracles was through the sacred Mount Light Sin, which had the same jade slab in previous lore. The ritual called Casting Jade would be enacted by the urban 
Lord and Fujin to calm rivers, improve weather, and create miracles. Such miracles and sweet rains that we could see at the end of the quest were the same blessings that humanity thanked the gods for and continued their worship because of it. The Rain Jade Rites were annual times of celebration and abundance, with Wusho beast dances, fragrant incense throughout the land, and songs of a carp adeptus and fireworks, in honor of the adepti that saved Chen Yu Vale. Quite similar to the Lantern Rite in today's Liwe, as well as another Rite of Dissension where Morax would grace the land and guide humanity. You might notice some differences between the two eras. One gives blessings and miracles in exchange for allegiance and worship of the people, while the other gains faith and respect in leading and guiding humanity. But this in turn creates the inconsistency of relying on humanity because humans are selfish and often forget their own history. Hence the difference in legends told by elders, where all the blessings, miracles, and battles were done by Morax and his warriors to fight the evil gods and the local adepti of the Vale. But after finishing the quest itself, a more accurate story told by Fu Jin and Ling Yuan tells that the Archon War was the main culprit of turmoil. And rightly so. It's a war. The god of Chen Yu Vale wasn't evil by all accounts, but she was still a god. A god that was backed to a corner because of the war and was said to have gone mad that she couldn't defeat Morax. Back then in the Archon War, gods were supposed to fight each other for power, territory, and a seat at the Seven, lest they be swallowed, destroyed, or betrayed by other gods and people friend or foe. You can see how cruel and sad the reason why the Archon War began from the Archons themselves and the lost friends that they once had. In her last effort for power to rule, as well as an instinct for survival, Chen Yuvail's god wanted to flood the Bishui River, but that would also mean flooding all of Chen Yuvail. To save the land and humanity, both Fujin and the Herb Lord defected to the Seven. Not sure if they spoke with Morax himself at the time or they just betrayed their own god. And in an attempt to save Chen Yu Vale, Ling Yuan quote unquote attacked people using her familiars and led them to the cave shelters they created, where the humans would then create murals. Now you can find these familiars of Ling Yuan roaming around the shelters and paths of escape that humans would have taken. Fujin, on the other hand, threw the jades she once wore in the river, releasing her adeptal energy and creating the Jade Mouth and its whirlpool to stop the flood from destroying both Chen Yu Vale and all of Liwe. While the Herb Lord fought to hold back their mistress, the god of Chen Yu Vale. Fujin also sealed and hid rain jades to save their culture, like the one in the Jade Mouth and the one in Qi Zhang Wall, as mentioned in Echoes of an Offering. By the end of the Archon War, the Herb Lord was said to have been cut into pieces, Fujin sinking into the sea, and the beast Ling Yuan was left powerless and alone. While the god of Chen Yu Vale faced what we can only assume as her complete and utter destruction in pursuit of power or survival. What followed the Archon War was a series of blizzards that froze and melted the land multiple times before becoming part of Li Wei entirely. Fujin and Ling Yuan seems to not know about the Cataclysm 500 years ago since at the time they were likely still reeling from the war and regaining their strength. Moving on to current day Chen Yu Vale and Tevat, now dominated by humanity, it highlights what has recently been mentioned from Nuvolet's vision lore as the natural order of Tevat or Chen Yu Vale. This change in quote unquote nature through Ling Yuan's adjustments of the spirit veins or ley lines resulted in the miasma phenomenon, which is the release of spiritual power and allowing adeptal beings in Chen Yu Vale to be free and powerful once more. This in turn affected multiple creatures that were exposed to it. Most of the enemies we fight are miasma infested hilly churls and creatures of the overworld. Also, there seems to be no abyss related creatures that can be found in Chen Yu Vale apart from ruin constructs. What this means, however, is that Tevat's original natural state could be akin to the miasma itself, which is a land overflowing with spiritual energy, allowing those to be affected by it and become somewhat adeptal slash elemental creatures. But this poses a question regarding the entirety of Tevat's natural order or state, which goes back to what we have commonly known since the start of the game as the Heavenly Principles. See, the Heavenly Principles' initial translation was supposed to be called natural order. This term was used by Zhong Li and his friend Kun Jun or Ejdaha in the following statements, for example. 
People abandon and surrender the things they love to pursue the right path. Perhaps this is the erosion imposed on me by the heavenly principles. Morax shared with us some of his power to prevent further erosion. But it was futile. Everything returns to dust. It is the natural order. An unstoppable force. Now putting this into perspective, the natural order of Tevat is either of two states. An order in which elemental energy is in abundance and elemental beings are free to roam the lands, which translates to what we know as the Old World, and is where the Dragon Sovereigns ruled Tevat. The other is a nature that maintains humanity's grasp on the world, and a world that is managed by the Heavenly Principles and is kept at bay by the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, which we can now call the Sustainer of Natural Order. So try going back to every bit of story dialogue and replace the word Heavenly principles with natural order. Pair that up with Nuvolet's vision lore and add to that the reason our sibling wishes to topple the heavens of Celestia. I'll let your thoughts develop regarding what I just said. But did you know that ley lines and the Ermin soul are more related to the human realm? than they are to the light realm. Elemental energy is stored within ley lines of which all originate from the Ermin soul. But dragons are the prime of elemental energy. So how come leyline energy and, by extension, the Ermin soul belong to humanity? The answer? The Seven, which is revealed to be created to suppress the original order of the world. This is basically a few details to add to the good old notion that dragons are right and that the sky is a lie. Next is the relation between Fujin and Ling Yuan as Adepti, of which they seem to be two different types. Although Ling Yuan is a beast, her adeptal energy is more of an innate, adeptal or spiritual power. An illuminated beast, born with illumination compared to what Fujin has which is gained through the spirit veins of the land. This means that Ling Yuan's adeptal energy is more akin to the elemental power that Vishaps possess compared to the adeptal energy that we know from most adepti related to cultivation in spiritual culture. Like Shan Yun being a full adepti and her three or four disciples Shen He, Gan Yu, Yuan Dai, and maybe Shu Yu who all practice and wish to practice cultivation. Now I would point you towards Ashikai's recent video on cultivation and talent for elemental energy for more info on that, since this segment leans more towards Ling Yuan being a pure adeptal or elemental being than the concept of cultivation itself. Think of Ling Yuan as a descendant of elemental dragons long ago, which are the prime of elemental beings. Finally, the primordial era and the mural with the concept of exchange that Ling Yuan calls give and take. This I think is likely something she learned from their master, the god of Chen Yu Vale. A possible old practice of humans and the gods before the Archon War and Envoy era is the act of worship and asking for blessings, which is mentioned in many old world lore from Dragon Spine's Envoys, Inazuma's Surumi Island, and Enkonomiya's primordial era, where humans would worship and give offerings to their god in return for blessings and miracles, while emissaries and priests would be able to receive these blessings from the envoys. Next is the ancestors of Chen Yu Vale who were said to be 10 feet tall tattooed people whose warriors wield massive jade axes with near light speed. The height difference and similarity I could find is the tattoo covered axe and club wielding hilly churls who are the only other humanoid creatures that dwell in Chen Yu Vale. Now if you think about it, the ancestors of Chen Yu Vale once resided in the Chasm when Morax was still young, which was around 6,000 years ago. This time period before 6,000 years ago is likely the time of the Primordial One or the Envoy Era, and the Upside Down City as mentioned by Dainsliff is likely from that same time period, which points us to the final, rather the first mural in Qi Zhang Wall, the Falling Star 6,000 years ago, and the divine nail in the chasm. This adds to the notion that 6,000 years ago, humans lived in the chasm where the upside down city is, and someone found the secrets of the sky and the abyss, which then caused that divine nail or the star to fall into the chasm. You can link this back to before the sun and moon, and the covenant made with the primordial one about temptation, as well as the three moon sisters that married a human traveler if you wish, but that's too much theory. What I can say is that the people who 
didn't become cursed with abyssal knowledge or did not die from the star and the divine nail likely fled to Chenyu Vale 6,000 years ago, leaving the chasm, their upside-down city, and the slew of abyss creatures still inside. That would mean that some humans in Chenyu Vale are the descendants of those who lived through the Second Heavenly War, which could be the first instance of abyssal energy being found and used. Interestingly, the Yaksha, who were created after the Archon War, also possess tattooed bodies and also wear masks. And one of them, Minogius, wears one that looks like the mask that Serpent Knights drop. He even looks like a lector when you put them side by side. So maybe Zhongli took inspiration from the warriors of Chenyu Vale back in the Archon War and used them to defend Liwe from the Chasm and the Abyss Monsters, which is pretty ironic because that's where all of Chen Yuvale's people likely came from. Next is the details that Hilly Churls can harness elemental energy without having visions. Again, back to elemental cultivation and elemental aptitude. And interestingly, the many simulacrum statues within Chen Yuvale mentions fighting demons, creating roadblocks, and defending areas of Chen Yuvale from said demons. These simulacrum statues statues are likely the warriors of Chenyu Vale that came from the chasm, similar to other statues in different regions. It seems like they already made quite a base or city in Qishang Wall too, which makes sense why Fujin would hide one of the rain jades there as well as the fourth mural being there as well. The simulacrum then became part of Chenyu Vale's culture, which was needed to guard the entrances to Mount Lai Chin before the rain jade rite starts. But this rite as well as the seemingly peaceful relation of Chenyu Vale's humans and their god was ruined by the Archon War, as mentioned. The tall, armored soldiers of Liwe with impossibly heavy weapons and armor is a relation to the lithic weapon set that the Millilith once used. These weapons and the Millilith itself were founded after the completion of Liwe Harbor. And the only reason why these lithic weapons couldn't even be lifted by modern soldiers is because Liwe currently isn't at war. This again goes back to adepto slash elemental talent that their ancestors once had, which was to protect and defend their land. And, well, Zhongli's power as one of the primes of Adepti. And that's basically all the details I could find for you guys about Chen Yu Vale. Honestly, at this point, I feel bad for the people of Chen Yu Vale. <laughs> I mean, imagine being in a bloodline of ancestry who lived through the Heavenly War, the Archon War, and the Cataclysm. And to top it off, you have no record of that ever happening. Only stories from your elders that barely remember anything because of erosion, natural order, and the ermine soul. Ignorance is bliss, I guess. Anyway, that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one, yeah? Like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!